Um, to me, if somebody is using subject to seller financing, options, leases, um, anything like that, that is just a, a, a form of financing. It's not creative. What I deem as creative is solving somebody's problem, a, you know, a seller in this example, by stacking these strategies. So if you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, also known as the Private Money Authority. And on this podcast, this is where we talk about raising private money without ever having to ask for money. Well, today I've got an amazing guest to join me and quite a background does he have. His expertise, in addition to private money, I mean, for goodness sakes, he's raised $20 million in private money so far. But in addition to being an expert in raising private money, he also has expertise uh, around the topics of creative deal structuring, wholesaling, flipping, landlording, uh, all the way to lending and investing, you know, throughout the years. Now, he's been involved in thousands of transactions in his career. And what really sets him apart, like myself, is his love for people and his love for their success. He co-founded a private lending company and a real estate acquisition company. In addition to that, he founded and ran the Central Wisconsin Real Estate Investors Association. In just a moment, you're going to meet my good friend and guest, Mr. Derek Dombeck, right after this. Well, hello, Derek, and welcome back to the show. Well, thanks for having me back, Jay. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Enjoyed having you the first time. Glad to have you back again. And let's dive in, first of all, and talk about your experience in raising private money. After all, the name of this show is Raising Private Money. And I love to talk with other real estate investors that have raised their own private money, how they go about it, their favorite ways to raise private money, how they get the word out. Uh, but before we get to those questions, um, I'd like to hear your story, Derek, uh, again, I'd like for my audience to hear it as to what was it that happened in your real estate investing business that even caused you to start raising private money? Well, Jay, I uh, got my butt kicked in the real estate market in 2007. And at that point, my credit took a hit. I was no longer bankable and, and I had two choices. Either I learned how to, number one, learn how to get creative with deal structuring and also raise private money, take on partners, whatever it takes. And that's the very short abbreviated version. And I know we had gone into it in more depth on the previous show I was on. But the second thing I think that's important to note is learning how to actually talk to people properly so as you had mentioned early on, you're, you're not asking for money. People are, are asking you, how can I invest with you or through you? And how do you create a space and that type of scenario to where they're asking you instead of you asking them? For me, it's, it's really simple. I, I just tell stories about deals that I've done in a, a manner that would, would at, you know, lead them to ask more questions. So one example, and this was several years ago, uh, a friend of mine, we were driving in a pickup truck and he was asking me about buying a house in his neighborhood. Him and his neighbor were talking about fixing it up and flipping it. And he had never flipped a house before. And I said to him, his name is Mike. I said, Mike, um, we went through his whole deal. We figured out that they were going to make about a 10% return on their money if everything went well. And I said, Mike, I, I pay my investors 10% for doing nothing. And they're in a <laughs> first position mortgage against the property. And his next question was, are you looking for any more investors? I never asked him for money, and I, but I led him down a path that I had already obviously had a preconceived conclusion 
that I want it to happen. And the ironic thing is, I think people prejudge everybody else, right? We're always thinking, I got to go talk to the, the high net worth doctors, lawyers, um, high W-2 income earners. Mike and his, his wife, um, I didn't know what they had at that time. I had just approached him and said, Mike, I've got a deal coming up. I need about $67,000. And so he funded that first deal. And I asked one question that I always ask, Mike, if I have another deal, should I call you? And he said, sure. So over a period of a year and a half, I put a, a, over half a million dollars of his money to work. And that was just cash that they had in money market accounts, bank CDs. And I was able to take his, you know, his return from an average of two and a half to 3% uh, up to about 8%. So we're changing people's lives as well. Absolutely. You just said two things that are very, very important. Number one is you're not asking, right? You're sharing, telling people, you know, what you do. And another very, very important thing that you uh, said that I want to reiterate is you didn't prejudge. I mean, you know, a lot of times the people that look like they got a money, I uh, got a lot of money are broke. And the people that are just walking around ordinary people like us are actually got extra cash laying around or they've got retirement funds that they are not happy with those returns, which there's an important point. Uh, it's very important as a real estate investor, if you want to attract private money, and uh, that is to establish a relationship with a self-directed IRA company. The one I recommend is questtrust.com out of Houston, Texas. Uh, and the reason that's important is when you're talking with someone that's got retirement funds and they're not happy with the returns they're getting, maybe it's in the stock market, maybe it's elsewhere. Uh, and when you learn that, well, it's very, very important to have that relationship, say with Quest Trust, to where you can introduce them to Quest Trust or a self-directed IRA company to where they can move their funds over tax-free or tax um, uh, no penalties, no tax consequences and become a private lender. So I love your, I love your answer and your philosophy there, Derek. It's all about creating win-win scenarios. Uh, it's all about educating other people as to what this world is about. I've got 47 private lenders right now that are funding our deals and not one of those 47 private lenders had ever heard of private money until I told them about it. It's all about putting your teacher hat on, which I call my private money teacher cap. You put that hat on and you start teaching them what it is. And now, you know, they're wanting to become involved. And so you've raised $20 million in private money, Derek. What kind of real estate deals have you raised that money for? Well, so previous to uh, January 1st, I was a co-owner of a hard money lending company. And um, my former business partner bought me out of that because for me now, I'm in acquisition mode. I'm, I'm really enjoying the, uh, the present market we're in. Some people are panicking. I, I think it's Christmas. So I raised a lot of that capital for the lending company. Now I'm raising capital for my own transactions, which are primarily residential real estate um, with some light commercial and also we're, we're looking at buying some existing businesses right now and RV parks. So that's where I'm currently doing. Now you just said something very interesting, Derek. So I want to go back to something you said just a moment ago. And that is, there's a lot of people out there panicking. They're thinking about, you know, where is the real estate investing market going? And you just said, you love this market. This is like Christmas. Why do you have that outlook in this market? Well, because of what I went through in 2007, as markets shift, we start to see for us that have been through some downturns or, or different markets, it's like knowing that the end of the movie and we can see things that oftentimes other people will miss. And I guess I'm, I call it a thinning of the herd. So the, the large number of real estate agents that we have, the large number of you know newer real estate investors that didn't really get educated. They just got in and, and possibly got lucky on some deals because anything that they were able to buy went up in value. They're, they're going to fall by the wayside. And that's not ideal for everybody, but it is reality. It is business. And 
for me personally, I do a lot of creative deal structuring. So I'm, you know, talking to people about taking over their debt or putting options in place, controlling property with leases, as well as just, you know, flat out buying them with cash. And I would say right now, 75% of the leads that I talk to are, are going down the path of potential creative structures of some sort. You just said something else interesting, and that is you like this market to where it's um, perhaps looking unstable to folks. It sort of clears the playing field, um, sort of gets rid of the other investors that are making stupid, crazy offers on real estate deals that keeps us from who knows what's going on to uh, getting those deals. So uh, I had a good friend recently say, you know, my favorite time is when times get rough and tough because again, it clears the playing field, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's the follow the herd mentality. Um, I like to go the opposite direction of the herd. So the last few years, people were chasing apartment complexes. I didn't even look at an apartment complex. I, I didn't see any reason to risk my money or my investors money on a, a four cap or a five cap property. And especially using institutional debt, which personally, I haven't used an institution for any investment property since about 2011. So I like dealing with people, not institutions. Um, and, and right now, that is very, very easy to do compared to the last four or five years. Well, the reason I love dealing with people is because in this world of private money, we get to make the rules, the borrower, we're the borrower. And how do we make the rules? Well, we make the rules by actually, instead of getting on our hands and knees at the bank and putting our hands underneath our chin and begging for the bank to approve our deal and having to raise our skirt up and the bankers looking at our personal financial statement and et cetera, we make the rules. We set the interest rate. We set the frequency of payments. And you know, the difference on borrowing institutional money is instead of applying or asking for a mortgage, we're actually offering a mortgage. And you know, it's just a, uh, it's, it, it's a, it's a win win scenario where everybody wins. The private lenders win. We, we win as the borrower. And I tell you, Derek, Carol Joy, my wife and I, we have received so many uh, thank you notes and verbal thank yous from our private lenders, particularly our elderly private lenders. And they tell us that we have changed and impacted their retirement years by allowing them to travel, go where they want to, when they want to go. You know, they've, they've got a nice chunk of principal investment capital, but they don't want to touch the principal. They want that principal to work for them so they can, you know, enjoy their retirement years. And you've probably experienced the same thing, right? Yeah. In fact, I've got a good friend of mine. He's, he's quoted to say it's, it's uh, inconvenient to be physically alive, but financially dead. And when you start talking to people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s that, that didn't plan for their financial future and they have their money sitting in, in a, anything that's getting less than, than six, 7%, they're losing money. I mean, inflation is arguably much higher than that, but they're, they're absolutely losing money if they're tying up their money in a bank CD or, or anything small. So I've had plenty of people that send me Christmas cards. Thank yous, the same thing. In fact, that first story I told you about Mike, you know, he has referred me to other people, but he always says, Derek, um, you keep my money working first. It's okay if you talk to this person or that person, but promise me you'll keep my money working first. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and I've experienced the same thing. Um, you know, I say I've got 47 private lenders. Well, if you're starting out raising private money and working with individuals to fund your deals, you don't need 47 private lenders for goodness sakes. All you need is one or two to start. And like you said, uh, Derek, I mean, they're going to spread the words, you know, private lenders flap their lips and uh, talk to their friends. I mean, there's probably not a private lender that I actually raised the money from that they didn't refer other people to me as well. And as a result of that, I actually have not actively raised private money in a long time because that foundational group of people 
that I actually taught about private money, then they just have referred other people to us. And those people have referred other people to us. And as a result, I got a problem right now. I've got one and a half million dollars approximately, what I call just sitting on the shelf from our private lenders that I have not been able to put the work and they're in like what I call the queue. And, but I'd rather have that problem than um, having deals and no money. <laughs> Well, and the fact that you call it a problem, many of the listeners might be shocked by that, but it is actually a problem. And we had the same challenge when we were running the lending company specifically because we either had too many loan applications and we couldn't fund the loans or we had too much money sitting on the side and we needed more loans. And it's a balancing act for sure. It's a little different now raising money for my own transactions because to raise money for a lending company, we can put it on the street within a matter of days. But now, as you mentioned, we have to kind of get people queued up, then find a deal that works for their scenario that they like. And hopefully they didn't go and put their money somewhere else. So there is definitely a, an aspect of timing, Jay. Oh, that's for sure. And you just said something that reminded me of this. You know, here's one thing that drives me crazy. And, you know, you've you have been the, the person in charge of running RIAs, you know, in the past. So I'm getting ready to share something that I know you've heard. You've probably heard it over a hundred times. I know I've heard it hundreds of times. And when I hear educators say what I'm getting ready to say, it absolutely drives me crazy, Derek. And that is, you've heard them say, oh, just get the deal under contract. The money will show up. I want to throw up. It's like, why are you telling people that? Is the money just going to like rain out of clouds or something? And so I practice and I teach the exact opposite. The money comes first. There's always going to be deals. There's always going to be deals. Get your relationships in place and have that ready to go. I mean, just think how much more confident you're going to be when you got money burning a hole in your pocket. How much more confident you're going to be? How many more offers are you going to make? knowing exactly, you know, where the funding is going to come from. And quite frankly, Derek, I don't want to be going under contract on a deal to purchase and I don't have a clue where the money's coming from. Yeah. And the same educators are telling their students, just put escape clauses in your contract. And in the event you can't get the money or you can't close, you can walk away. No harm, no foul. Except I don't know about you, Jay. I've spent a lot of years building a good name for myself and I don't want that name dragged through the mud because I couldn't perform on a contract. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was, I had a guest on uh, the show here recently and we were having this conversation and I, uh, and I said to him, I said, why do educators, gurus, et cetera, teach that baloney? He said, I can tell you why they say that baloney, Jay. I said, please tell me. He says, because they're selling a course on how to get a deal under contract and how to find deals. And they don't have a clue how to tell you how to get the funding for it. <laughs> Absolutely. And they also don't care. I, I shouldn't say all of them, but a lot of them don't care. It's a numbers game. They know there's five to 10% of the people that buy their course that are actually going to succeed and the rest are going to fail miserably. So I, I'm not a fan of any of those educators myself. Yeah. Well, and another thing, like, you know, when I educate real estate investors, the only thing that I teach and share is exactly what I am doing and what's working in today's market, you know? So speaking of what's working in today's market, in addition to private lending, you are an expert in creative financing, creative structuring. And, you know, people hear that phrase, but they really don't know what that means. So let's unpack that, uh, Derek, in the time that we've got remaining. Uh, what is creative financing? First of all, what do you mean by that phrase or terminology? My definition of creative financing is not the same as most people. Um, to me, if somebody is using subject to seller financing, options, leases, um, anything like that, that is just a, a, a form of financing. It's not creative. What I deem as creative is solving somebody's problem, a, you know, a seller in this example, by stacking these strategies. So one quick example is I bought a house um, from a woman named Jan. 
Jan was behind on her payments. She needed $10,000 cash up front. She would take the remainder of, of her uh, sale price and payments over time. The house needed a, a light rehab. And then my intention was to lease option it. So I needed about $20,000 of cash, catch up her payments, take over subject to her first mortgage. She carried back um, second mortgage in at 0% financing for about six years. Then I contacted a financial friend and I'm very nosy with what my financial friends have. And I said, Dan, I need $20,000 from your IRA. I'll pay you 6% interest only and 20% of the equity when I sell the property in the future. And we finished up the property, put a lease option tenant in, the, in there. Two years later, the lease option tenants exercised. Everybody got paid off. We stacked about five or six strategies in that deal alone. I love it. As you were sharing that story, it reminded me of a house that I bought on Country Club Road here in Moorhead City. And the seller of the house owed $145,000. And uh, they wanted $30,000 uh, in their pocket over and beyond the payoff of $145,000. So I bought that house subject to the existing note for the sake of our audience. That simply means you as the real estate investor, you are agreeing to make the seller's mortgage payments, but you're not assuming the loan. That means the lender would have to approve it. When you buy subject to the existing note, that has nothing at all to do with the lender. The lender's not even involved in the transaction. This is an agreement between you and the seller. Sellers keeping the mortgage in their name and you're making the payments. And you may ask yourself, well, what seller in the world would agree to leave the mortgage in their name? And I can tell you, it's a seller that wants debt relief is who it is. And so I bought this house subject to the existing note, $145,000 was the payoff. And then I borrowed, here we are stacking strategies, uh, as you just shared, Derek, I borrowed the $30,000 from a private lender and I put that private lender's note in second position underneath the first mortgage. And uh, in addition to that, I knew I could sell the property quickly for about 250,000 as is. But if I put $25,000 in renovations in it, I could get 325. So what did I do? I bought it subject to for 145. I got a private lender for 30,000 which equaled the 175,000 purchase price. And then I got another private lender at 25,000 in third position. And now I got 200,000 in it with the rehab and sold it for 325. So you're absolutely right, Derek. Once someone becomes skilled and knowledgeable on the different strategies that you can use to fund a deal or to sell a deal, as you just mentioned, selling it on lease purchase, then you can combine these strategies. I appreciate you sharing that story, Derek. Yeah, for sure. And and I really like the equity participation structure that I use um, because it can keep our payments low uh, as far as the interest. And they're participating in the, the resale of the property or the refinance of the property, which means if it happens quickly, their yield is significantly higher. But if it happens over time or a period of years, they're participating in the upside and the downside risk. And my investors love it. I, I'm right now I'm doing a fair number of deals with 10 and 10, 10% interest only and 10% of the net profits when I sell or refinance. And that's not a hard pitch to anybody with an IRA. Absolutely. One reason or one of the main reasons that people get involved in real estate as an investor is they are interested in the wealth. They're interested in the freedom. And I know one thing that you talk a lot about, Derek, is your vision and loving your life. What is your vision? How do you love your life? Why do you talk about it? Well, the Generations of Wealth, which is my platform, it's also my podcast, um, thegenerationsofwealth.com is, is for me a way to give back this knowledge and education that my mentors and, and my peers gave to us. And that's really where the, the name, the generations of wealth came from. But it's not just about financial wealth. It, we do really 
focus on living our vision for our personal lives first and then structuring our business to support our personal vision. And so live your vision, love your life is our tagline because so many people go out there and they, they build it or try to build a monster business. They work 60, 70, 80 hours a week with the hope that someday they'll get, you know, be able to enjoy the fruits of their labor, but someday doesn't often turn out the way they thought it would. And maybe they don't have their health. Maybe they don't have their, their spouse or their kids anymore, or a thousand different scenarios that could happen. So I truly want to live every day as, as if it's my last and I could make a lot more money if I wanted to work a lot more hours, but I really do enjoy the time I spend with my family and my friends and, and doing things like this, Jay. I mean, just having awesome conversations with, with people like yourself and trying to spread the knowledge. Be sure and check out Derek's website, which is www.thegenerationsofwealth.com. Again, that's www.thegenerationsofwealth.com. So what you're saying, Derek, is business owners and entrepreneurs should not be happy with the leftovers of their business for themselves, but they should actually, as you said, identify what vision and what lifestyle and how they want to live their life. And once that's identified, have the business support the vision and the lifestyle that they want. In the couple of minutes we've got left, Derek, share with the audience, what is part of your vision that you have that you are loving living? Well, I had a few years ago, a, a peer or a mentor of mine had taken a 30-day RV trip with his family. And I, I told him how envious I was of him. And so he challenged me. He said, Derek, take, take 30 days off. And that was... 2021 was the first summer I did it. My wife and I and our three kids took actually five weeks. The, and we've done so the, the last three summers. And if you truly actually do that and figure out what is important to you, it's, it's absolutely going to change your life. Uh, I came back from that first trip. And, and I will admit, I was a nervous wreck the first two weeks until I really realized that our staff and my support team and you know, everything that we've built was working just fine without me micromanaging. I came back from that first trip and, and two things happened. We changed the entire structure of how we ran our business and my involvement in it. And the second thing was we committed to do that trip every year. And I would challenge all of your listeners, even though right now you don't believe it's possible for you to take 30 days off, write it down in your vision, block it out on a calendar and Figure it out and it'll, it'll, it'll change your entire mindset. What systems did you have to put in place prior to going on that first five weeks? Um, or better, maybe the better question is what systems do you have in place now, uh, that allows you to go on a trip for five weeks? How much are you involved at all during that five weeks? Are you totally unreachable? Um, what's that look like? Well, the ironic part was we already had all the people in place that we needed. We just have to get out of their way and let them do their jobs and, and trust them that they can do their jobs without being micromanaged. Uh, currently, again, I exited the lending business. And so when I was doing that the last three years, I had a business partner. Um, we had a staff of about seven or eight people, and they were all very good at what they did. Right now, this year is going to be different. It's a little bit of a pivot, but my marketing team takes care of all the marketing. I have a full-time assistant who handles everything I don't like, which primarily is paperwork and scheduling. And I can, I can work remote. And what I typically did, especially that first time, Jay, I blocked off three hours each morning of the five-day work week for work. And we traveled with a, a fifth wheel travel trailer and I live in Wisconsin. We traveled West, which means we were in different time zones. Essentially I was done working before my family was even up and moving and it worked out very, very well. So I'm not going to say that I didn't work at all, but I wouldn't have had to have worked. It was, I enjoy what I do. So there's still a certain amount of time where I want to be talking to 
buyers, sellers, investors, you know, all the stuff that comes with our business. Really what it comes down to is you identified what's really important to you and you put a, a put a plan in place to actually realize it. hundred percent. I yep. love it. That's beautiful. There you have it. Another amazing episode of raising private money. I'm Jay Connor, the private money authority. Be sure and follow if you're listening on your favorite podcast platform. Uh, so you don't miss out on upcoming shows. If you happen to be watching on YouTube, be sure and ring that bell and subscribe, rate and review. I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Conner.